All right, I think we can start. Welcome everyone to this week Autonomy Talks. This week is a pleasure to have with us Professor Ketan Savla, who is an associate professor at the John Dorothy Shea Early Career Chair in Civil Engineering at the University of Southern California. Uh, something about Ketan, so he obtained his master's and uh, in applied mathematics and PhD in electrical engineering from uh, UC Santa Barbara. He then moved to the other coast where he was a research scientist uh, in the Laboratory for Information and Decision Systems at MIT. And also he is a co-founder and the chief science officer of a intelligent transportation systems company called Xtelligent. His current research interests are in distributed optimal and robust control, dynamical networks, state dependent queuing systems and mechanism design with major applications in civil infrastructure systems. As you can see from the bio, he has a number of awards and is active in many as, uh, as representative for many communities. Uh, among the awards, we note the NSF Career uh, Award and the George Axel B. Outstanding Paper Award. Today is going to talk about uh, one of the major topics he's involved with, which is the microscopic traffic flow control. And uh, if I understand correctly, you are giving a, an introduction about the topic and then you are presenting some of the algorithms you are developing. So I'm, I'm personally very excited about this. So I, I am happy to, to listen to the talk and, and give you the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, can you see the mouse at your end? Good. OK, I'll use that as my pointer. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to give this talk and thanks for the kind introduction. Um, so I will present work today, uh, which is in collaboration with uh, my PhD student Milad Kulatsanj, who is among the audience here, uh, who we co-advise, who I co-advise with Petro Swanu, who's my, who's my colleague at, at USC. Okay, so this, this talk is, uh, as Joel indicated, it's about um, control, traffic control, but at the microscopic level. Um, and specifically, the, our interest is in ramp meter uh, algorithm for freeway networks to regulate the flow into the network. Now, when you think of the word microscopic control, uh, there has been a lot of emphasis on controlling the, uh, the behavior of individual vehicles to, to achieve certain performance from the traffic. So in this talk, we are going to take the complementary approach. That is, we are going to assume some standard behavior of how uh, vehicles are going to behave inside the network, uh, whether they're automated or human driven, how they're going to merge from the, from the freeways. Uh, but we are going to do what is what could be called as a boundary control. And uh, there's a lot of literature on RAM metering control uh, out there, but most, if not all analytical results that exist are for using macroscopic models, so flow level models. And our contention is that those models do not have the resolution to model safety, which is becoming uh, very important when we look at increasing auto automation and connectivity. Um, but also they, yeah, and they do not have, essentially they do not have sufficient resolution. But also if you look at RAM meter, and I should, I should, uh, I should clarify by, I'm sure many of us know what RAM meters are, but these are this kind of uh, traffic signal uh, like objects that are situated at the entrance of a freeway. Uh, which, which alternate between uh, green and red. So uh, they are inherently built to do microscopic control, meaning control on a vehicle level. So typically you see signs like one vehicle per green or two vehicles per green. So they do regulate uh, control at a vehicle level, unlike let's say traffic signal control where they, uh, where in any given green, it could have a platoon of vehicles going, right? So by very construction, RAM meter is a microscopic control, and uh, but yet most of the literature is focusing on, on flow level control for when it comes to RAM metering. So because of all these uh, aspects, we are interested in microscopic level RAM metering control in, in, in the stock. So, uh, so let me first by talking, uh, start by talking about what's our performance metric that we are going to use and then identify some, some constraints within which we are, we are going to design RAM metering. So the performance, so the most, one of the most common performance metric is travel time, obviously, but our contention is that there is even more fundamental metric than travel time, uh, which, is, uh, which is saturation limit. And so, and that's, that's a metric that has not gotten its due attention in the literature, at least at the network level. And so that's going to be our primary focus in this, in this talk. But in order to build uh, the construction towards this network level concept of saturation limit, let me quickly review what what are the similar concepts uh, in, in 
in the literature. So the most simplest concept uh, it can be gleaned from higher capacity manual, something that you would learn in any basic transportation class is the notion of traffic capacity at a bottleneck or on any given point on, on a traffic uh, segment, right? It, which is the maximum number of vehicles that can pass a given point, assuming no influence from, from downstream traffic operation, right? So it's a, it's a very localized notion. Uh, an implication of this is if the if the demand coming from upstream is greater than the traffic capacity, then you're bound to have Q. Uh, now it's extension to, to, there have been some extensions to beyond a single bottleneck or a single point. And uh, so, so for example, at the meso level, uh, which is which is really at the link level, perhaps, uh, you have the so-called fundamental traffic diagram, which adds a little bit more uh, resolution than just giving the flow capacity. It gives you the relationship between flow and density. But even, I mean, in the last couple of decades, there is also uh, a notion of macroscopic fundamental diagram, right? So where, uh, again, you could, you could infer the flow capacity by looking at the peak value of, uh, of, of this particular graph. So, so one could imagine that uh, perhaps this could be taken as a notion of network level capacity by looking at the, at the peak of this flow. Uh, so there are a couple of points that one has to remember when, when taking that approach. One is this is purely about, about uh, what's happening inside the network, but also uh, this, this is a scalar quantity. This flow is scalar quantity, which, which naturally is, is probably obtained by taking average of uh, flows on various links in the network, right? So, Knowing the flow capacity at the macro level doesn't tell me, for example, uh, how much demand can arrive at the ramp with, before saturating the network. It doesn't clearly, it doesn't obviously tell because there's so many entry points. One single uh, notion of flow capacity doesn't give you, doesn't characterize you what should be the flow that should be entering from different ramps so that, uh, so that uh, I do not saturate the network. But also, uh, this is purely an empirical approach. So once you decide a RAM metering uh, or any control algorithm, you can you can do simulation, you can do experiments, observations, and then find the find this capacity as an after 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 kind of thing. What we are interested in is defining a notion of network capacity or network saturation limit, where, which we can use for for algorithm design rather than just performance evaluation after the fact. Um, so the key. One of the key messages uh, that I want to again emphasize is that the saturation limit does depend upon the RAM metering. They're not independent. And the reason why I emphasize is because commonly in the literature, uh, the, the steps taken are as follows. So you first look at the macroscopic uh, fundamental diagram, you calibrate the model, and then you design the control policy, like uh, boundary control, for example. And somehow, uh, there is kind of a decoupling, which doesn't make sense, because the fundamental diagram itself depends on what control policy you're using. So, so that is that is also the motivation for the stop. Anyway, so that's the performance metric, and I'll be formally defining that very soon. Uh, and here are the basic constraints, uh, safety constraints within which we'll have we'll be designing our metering, and these are all at the microscopic level. So, uh, when on the main line, uh, we will uh, rely upon low-level controllers, then maintain a certain safety space gap, right? So, the the space gap uh, is speed dependent. Uh, its expression is, is shown here. So there's a basic safety margin, approximately one car length, plus some speed dependent distance. Uh, this factor here is the called, many times called the headway constant, for instance. Uh, its value is chosen based on what kind of worst, worst case scenario are you taking into account in terms of braking, et cetera. And the last term is really plays a role only when there's a difference between the speed of the vehicle and the, uh, the preceding vehicle. Uh, so there are, there are many, uh, Controllers, low-level controllers in the literature that uh, use this as a reference uh, trajectory that they want. It's a reference gap that they want to achieve, and also uh, there is some evidence that humans also tend to follow similar kind of uh, gap when they are when they're following in the traffic. Right. So that's that's kind of the space gap that we are going to assume has to be followed by all the vehicles. A special case of this is when all the vehicles are moving at free flow, so at, at speed limit. In that case, uh, the last term disappears. And we, the space gap is safety margin plus h times the speed limit. Okay, so that's the space gap. We can convert into so-called time gap by dividing the space gap with the speed. So let let me denote this special quantity tau, which corresponds to time gap at the speed limit uh, as as tau. And one one significance of of tau is it 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 specifies at least under this vehicle following model the maximum flow that can be achieved on, on any section. So that would be one over tau, right? So at the speed limit, 
the time gap between two vehicles is going to be tau, and therefore one of tau, one over tau is going to be the maximum flow capacity on any given segment. So that is in some sense going to be the fundamental limit on, on the flow on a segment level. Right, and we are going to build upon a notion of for network capacity or network saturation limit built based on this link level uh, notions. Um, the other other uh, safety constraints are from merging behavior, right? So, and here it's important to uh, distinguish between high speed merge and low speed merge. And so, by high speed merge, I refer to scenarios where uh, you could merge at the speed limit. So this would happen, for example, when the ramps are long. Uh, and so uh, the safety considerations in that case, so assuming that all the vehicles on the main line are traveling at the speed limit, uh, and if there is a gap of two tau, right? So two times the, the gap that uh, two vehicles would maintain, the minimum gap they would maintain if they were traveling at the speed limit. So if the gap observed on the main line is at least two tau, then a vehicle waiting at the ramp could, could join it safely somewhere in between, right? If it could, if it could uh, merge at the speed limit. If the ramps and, and uh, after merging, the low level controller on board the vehicles will guarantee safety forever, for example, after that, right? Uh, however, many practical cases, you, you do not have that possibility of merging at the speed limit, which can, which can uh, cause disturbance in traffic and something that has to be taken into account in this kind of uh, uh, flow analysis. So in a low, in a low merge speed case, uh, as you would imagine, uh, the vehicle here, the green vehicle has to wait for a bigger gap let's say slightly bigger than two tau. And the reason is because uh, when it's going to merge, uh, it will merge probably closer to the leading vehicle. But so again, the orange vehicles are traveling at the speed limit. The, the orange, the green vehicle, uh, perhaps um, the right thing for the green vehicle to do is merge closer to the preceding vehicle, but because it's moving slow, it's going to start lagging behind. But then by the time, hopefully when it achieves its speed limit, it, it would be at least tau distance from the behind vehicle also. Right. So in order to achieve this, the initial gap that it needs between the two vehicles is three tau. Right. So the idea is that when when the merge speeds are low, the vehicles have to wait for a bigger gap as compared to when they're when the when they're when they're able to merge at high speed. And this will have implications on on flow, on on what's the throughput that you can achieve on a given ramp, uh, and that will be explicitly taken into account in our in our uh, analysis. Okay, so I've described to you in, in this uh, how the vehicles behave from the point they're released from the ramp until they exit the network. So, I mean, once they release from the ramp, uh, they, they merge uh, and they follow this vehicle level controller. And once they reach their destination off ramp, they exit the network. So this is how what happens inside the network. Uh, in order to complete the specification, let me specify the travel demand. So what's how, how vehicles arrive at the, at the ramps, right? So, uh, Let's say if there are M ramps, then uh, let's assume the average rate to be lambda one through lambda M. And the other part of the travel demand is going to be uh, specified in terms of the origin segment matrix. So the origin segment matrix uh, are uh, the RIJ entry gives you what fraction of demand coming from ramp I will need to use segment J. So segment is the section of the freeway between two successive ramps. So for example, the segment, uh, here will be segment one, this will be segment two, and this will be segment three, right? So this encapsulates this notion of origin segment matrix, encapsulates uh, the OD matrix, as well as the route choice behavior, right? So this will be our characterization of the demand. So with, with this specification, I've specified the demand process uh, almost completely. Why almost completely? Because in order to specify it really completely, I need to provide more statistics over of the, of the arrivals. For example, the inter-arrival times. Rather than just specifying the fraction, I need to be, give more specifics for, for destination choice. It turns out that those quantities will not, will play a role in some points, uh, those statistics, those fine level statistics will play a role in the performance evaluation, but I'll postpone those, those details uh, when it's necessary. So with this specification, um, uh, we borrow this notion of, of capacity, I guess, from communication systems. Uh, so for a given algorithm, RAM metering algorithm, we say that the network is undersaturated under a given demand if, if the queues access at all the RAMs remain unbounded. And uh, the, the question we want to ask is what RAM metering algorithms keep the network uh, undersaturated for maximal combination of this demand, right? Uh, so uh, as, uh, as some of you might hear, some of you might imagine the way we are going to do this is we are going to characterize the some kind of fundamental limit 
on what's the maximum uh, demand that can be sustained uh, under any algorithm. And we are trying to then we'll try to come up with an algorithm uh, which we will try to achieve that limit as close as possible. Um, so that's that's the agenda. So uh, so as I said, our focus in this talk is on is primarily on saturation limit, but it has it has fundamental implications for travel time also, which is one of the most commonly used performance metric in the literature. Uh, the and 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 this can be seen by follows, right? So uh, for any algorithm, once you know its saturation limit uh, using standard queuing argument, it's known that the travel time uh, grows highly nonlinearly as we as the demand approaches the saturation limit. Uh, so uh, if if by chance if if uh, if we discover that the current and which we will which will make a claim that uh, the, the well-known existing parametering algorithms, in fact, do not give the maximum saturation limit, then that could have uh, big implications for travel time. So for example, the uh, black curve would be the delay curve for a given parametering algorithm. And if you are able to come with a parametering algorithm which achieves a bigger saturation limit, then at the practical demand level, which is where we want to operate the systems at, there will be a big gap in, in the travel time. And as we will see, uh, in the in the in the simulation studies that I'll report soon, so travel times uh, saturation limit uh, improving the saturation limit has a big implication on travel time, highly highly nonlinear implication on travel time, and in spite of this, uh, there has been very little attention on this performance metric at a network level, both at the micro level and at the macro level, to the best of our understanding. So our objective is to kind of fill in this gap. Uh, so having said that, let's uh, let me let me now start characterizing what is the maximum saturation limit we could we could ever achieve. And our starting point is this existing notions of uh, capacity at the segment level, right? So the um, the 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 we we are going to derive a saturation limit based on a simple principle that the demand induced on any freeway segment cannot exceed saturation limit. Uh, cannot exceed the saturation flow on that on that segment. So uh, the, way we are, the way one can compute the demand induced on a given freeway segment is from the demand arriving at the ramp and from the origin segment matrix, right? So if the demand arriving at segment at the ramp J is lambda J, then RJK is the fraction of that demand that wants to use segment K. And so if I sum it, sum it over all the ramps, that will tell me what demand will be induced on this particular segment K, right? So rho K, tells you the demand, the travel demand induced on, on segment K. And this cannot be more than the fundamental flow that can be the, the maximum flow that I can ever achieve on that segment. On any segment, the maximum flow that I can achieve is when, when all the, uh, when all the uh, vehicles are nicely spaced, exactly tower apart, moving at the speed limit, et cetera, right? So if this condition is violated, then no matter how sophisticated is a parametering algorithm, coordinated, uncoordinated, localized, learning-based, whatever, uh, it, it cannot prevent saturation, right? So this is in some sense a fundamental limit that every parametering algorithm has to satisfy. Um, and uh, one, in order to contrast it with, let's say, existing notion of max flow from the, uh, from the macroscopic fundamental diagram, uh, this is a characterization of a set. So it, it defines the set of lambda and R, uh, which are feasible, meaning under which there is hope to keep the network under saturated, right? So a quick example uh, to show this uh, in, in the case of this particular circular geometry, if this R is the, is the origin segment uh, matrix, and if I, in order to, in order to show the, uh, in order to illustrate graphically what the, what the set will look like, uh, uh, let me fix, so it's lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. Uh, so the, the, the feasible set would be the set of all lambdas and R. So lambda is a three dimensional vector, R is a three by three matrix. Uh, so in order to show a projection of that feasible set into R2, I fix R and I fix lambda three. And this, this gray region would be the feasible set, okay? So you want to, what you want to think, what you want to keep in mind is that there is a trade-off, right? So if you want to increase the demand uh, that you want to push in through ramp one, for example, if there is a game happening in the nearby, uh, if there's a special event happening, then you can achieve that, but at the expense of, of compromising uh, demand, uh, pushing in flow through some other ramps. So, uh, so having characterized this fundamental limit, uh, we want to know if, if we can achieve, if we can achieve this, right? What you want to, uh, 
recognize is that uh, this parametering algorithm is pretty agnostic of many, many facets that could be relevant for parametering. For example, coordination between the ramps, initial condition, uh, uh, vehicle dynamics, and all of those could play a role in what kind of, uh, whether, whether the network becomes saturated or not. So naturally, it's, it's reasonable to imagine that perhaps this is a loose limit. Right, it, it may be, may or may not be able to achieve achieve this limit, and the geometry also plays a role. For example, so uh, when we design our performance algorithm, when we design our parametering algorithms and provide performance analysis, in some cases you will see a gap with respect to this limit, and in some cases you won't, meaning this will be achieved exactly, and the gap will be reflective of the complications arising because of this real world effects like geometry and all of that. So. I'm going to describe a few algorithms uh, uh, which have different operating principles, but they all have some common architecture. And that common architecture has, has two, two basic principles, right? So one is uh, this notion of slots and notion of cycles. So uh, the slots work in the following way. So uh, let's divide the main line into slots, which are, which are uh, traveling at the speed limit and exactly tau apart tau gap apart, tau time gap apart, okay? And uh, there are slots also on the ramps, but they're spaced differently. So uh, they're, they're, they're spaced or they are created so that they synchronize with the main lines. So imagine a conveyor belt on the, on the ramp that starts from the ramp meter, but its speed is, is consistent with how the speed of a vehicle, if it was uh, accelerating from rest and trying to get to the speed limit without any obstruction. Right, so those will be the slots on the on the main line on, on, on the ramp. So this creation of slots uh, quantizes, in some sense, the times at which a ramp can release. Right, so uh, the objective would be a ramp wants to release a vehicle so that somewhere downstream, as soon as possible, it's able to occupy one of the slots. So the slots allow to synchronize because of this quantization of the time uh, at which the ramps can release. It allow, it allows some kind of coordination between release of vehicles from ramps. And this quantization also allows to not to unnecessarily disturb the traffic flow, right? Because if you if all the vehicles are moving uh, within the slot, and if you if you keep adding vehicles only within the slot, it will not disturb uh, disturb the traffic, and it will kind of keep the traffic flowing at the speed limit, right? Uh, the other notion is uh, is that of a cycle. Uh, so cycle. Uh, so every ramp will have a cycle. Uh, consisting of uh, time intervals uh, of length tau. And the idea of a cycle is the following, and the cycles will be synchronized at all the, all the ramps. And uh, the way the impact of the cycle is followed. So uh, a, a ramp, every ramp will not release, or the number of vehicles released by a ramp during a cycle is at most equal to the queue size waiting at the beginning of the cycle. Okay, so that's the principle which we are going to follow. Now, of course, the cycle length could be one, in that case, uh, essentially there is no constraint, right? So that is allowed, but we are going to allow a, a general cycle length. Moreover, uh, as you will see, some policies are going to use a fixed cycle length, uh, meaning they're going to reset the cycle every finite uh, time, a predetermined time. Uh, some policies will use a state dependent notion of cycle, meaning they, they can decide to terminate the cycle depending on the traffic condition, for example, right? But this cycle is going to be a common notion in, in the policies that we're going to discuss today. Okay, uh, so that's, that's a common uh, architecture. And the other is we are going to, because of this quantization of, uh, of the, induced by the slots, we have to, we have to slightly refine uh, our release criterion into, into the slots. And so let me clarify the, the release criteria. So there are two principles, two, two necessary conditions uh, that a ramp will consider before releasing a vehicle into a slot. So uh, before releasing a vehicle into a slot, uh, the, the ramp wants to make sure that this, this merging is going to be safe, right? So in order to do that, uh, well, the easy case is to imagine if let's say everybody is moving at the free flow speed, then it knows what the vehicles will likely do at, up to a certain distance downstream. And uh, so it wants to uh, release the vehicle at just the right time so that uh, once the green vehicle achieves the speed limit somewhere downstream, it occupies one of the, one of the slot, right? That does not, that the slot which, which it eventually occupies may not be the one that it occupied at the time of merging. So if, for example, in this animation, the green vehicle occupies the first slot, uh, but then because it's moving, uh, if it's moving at the high speed, but then 
if if it's more, if merge at the low speed, then it will it will lag behind and it will eventually uh, it will occupy the uh, the slot in, in the back, right? So the objective is is to again make sure that the merging is going to be safe. Uh, but also that the vehicle which is being released will occupy one of the slot when it achieves a steady state speed. Okay, so in order to do that, uh, the gap that this uh, ramp is going to look for uh, because of the quantized nature has to be a multiple of two tau, multiple of tau. So the minimum gap it will it will look for is two tau, but if the merge speed is low, it will have to look for higher, higher, higher gaps like three tau, four tau, etc. So that that is the quantization effect that will that will that we have to take into account. Uh, all right. Now, uh, naturally, one could ask uh, one, some standard uh, RAM metering algorithms, definitely the ones in practice, are of greedy nature. Meaning, as soon as you see a gap, so going back to here, one could ask a question: As soon as you see a sufficient gap, is it is it okay to release a vehicle? Right? Is it is it optimal to release a vehicle? Something that one could call as a greedy strategy. Right? So, uh, and yes and no. The answer is yes and no. So greedy strategy could be optimal. Uh, the, the message is that the greedy strategy could be optimal if the merging speeds are high, okay? So if the vehicles, if the ramps are long, which we have somewhere in, in some places in California here, then, then a greedy strategy could be, could be optimal. And here's a simple example. So imagine that in again, a three by three, three ramps, three off, three on ramps, three off ramps example here, you have flow coming in ramps one and two, and this is the, this is the origin segment matrix. Uh, but let's say the arrival process, now I'm specifying the details, is, is such that, so you have one over two tau arrival, so meaning you have one arrival every, every two tau seconds, right? And let's say it's exactly deterministic. Uh, but it's, it's such that the, uh, this is the same arrival at ramp one and ramp two, but they are they're offset just in the right manner, so that if you pay attention to this, to this animation, that uh, the vehicles coming in from ramp so when vehicles are released from ramp one, they fill, will fill up every alternate slot, uh, and that the gap, the slots that is left behind, will be filled in by ramp two, right? So as soon as as soon as a ramp two sees an empty slot, it will fill in, uh, and that will not create any any problem for ramp one downstream. Also, so by by greedily filling in the gaps that are in front of them, if this is the exact arrival process, could be could be efficient. Right, and in fact, our results suggest that uh, it's, this is true not only for deterministic arrivals, uh, but even for more general uh, stochastic arrivals. Uh, a greedy policy is is efficient, meaning it's it uh, it gives the maximum saturation limit uh, if the merge speeds are high. Okay, uh, and the, again, the reason for merge the way the merge speeds impact is how much gap that they're looking for. Right, so in this case. The merge speed for both RAM1 and RAM2 were high, therefore every alternate uh, slot was enough for them to fill it. However, let's look at the same demand scenario, but now uh, RAM1, let's say, is still high merge speed, but RAM2 is low merge speed, such a low that it needs a gap of two slots, uh, like the animation that I was seeing in the previous slide. And in this case, you will see that the greedy policy is not going to be sufficient because uh, RAM2 requires a two tau, like two slots, for, for, for it to release a vehicle, but then all the, when the ramp one is filling in the slots, it's filling in every every alternate slot, right? So if 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 ramp one was uh, releasing vehicles greedily, ramp two will never get a chance to to fill in a slot. So this this example suggests that you will need a coordination, right? In this case, when when the merge speeds are are small, which happens to be in most of the real world cases, so coordination is needed. Uh, is is definitely needed. But also, uh, there are some interesting, uh, interesting implications of this interarrival times on saturation limit. So, if you recall, when I prescribed the travel demand, I, I prescribed only the average, the average flow uh, coming at the ramps, the the fraction of demands wanting to go from certain origin of destination, and so on and so forth. But here is an example uh, to illustrate a very interesting aspect of the interarrival times. Okay, so let's consider a similar example as before, three on ramps, three off ramps. Uh, let's say, let's first consider the case where the arrivals at both the ramps, one and two, are deterministic according to this particular, uh, uh, this particular profile. So again, one arrival every two tau second. And in this case, uh, what you will see is, uh, so, Right, and so it's the same example as before where RAM2 is, is uh, short, 
and it will not be able to release any vehicle into into an empty slot because it needs two empty slots uh, uh, and therefore the queue size in ram2 will keep increasing okay but on the other hand if uh, if the arrival at if the arrival profile if the interarrival times at ramp 1 are different right so the same average rate meaning once every 2 seconds on an average once every 2 tau seconds on an average but instead there is a batch arrival right so there are arrivals happening uh, in 2 tau seconds and then no arrivals in the next 2 tau seconds etc right same arrival average but different realizations right in this case now what ha ended up happening is th there is a gap because of the under greedy policy ramp one will release will 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 allow gaps of two slots for ramp two to sneak in right so what this says is that under the same policy so i'm i'm showing the same policy greedy policy in both the cases the saturation limit will be different depending on the statistics of the arrival process okay so, and this is an interesting uh, phenomenon from a queuing thing perspective. So saturation limit, uh, characterizing saturation limit is akin to analyzing the stability of the underlying queuing system. And in most of the queuing systems, the stability criterion depends only on the first moment of the arrival process. Here we have a case where uh, the saturation limit tends to depend on the higher moments also, right? It depends on the variances. It depends on the specifics of the, of the arrival process rather than on the average. Moreover, this arrival process where you have higher variance, right? Because your batch arrival seems to give a higher saturation limit than the previous arrival process where, where we had a lower variance. So, so this is an interesting uh, phenomenon from a, uh, from a queuing systems perspective independently. But the message here is that saturation limit of, of freeway networks under parametric algorithms, when you think of it at a microscopic level, do tend to depend on higher moments. So we will, we will emphasize this as as needed as we go along in the in the in the talk okay so uh recall so now i'm going to uh, say some few policies right so recall the common architecture for all the policies is this notion of uh, slots and cycles right so the first policy that we are going to discuss is the so-called renewal policy where the cycle length is state dependent Okay, so the cycle resets when, a, when the state in the network uh, is, is satisfies certain criteria. And in fact, uh, this criterion is very simple. So the cycle restarts whenever the network becomes empty. And the, by network, I mean everything that's downstream of the ramp, including the main line up to the off ramp, right? So every, all, all the, the entire main line, once it becomes empty, and all the ramps, uh, the, the stretch of the ramp from the uh, of ramp meter up to the main line, if, as soon as that becomes empty, then the cycle resets. So you have to remember that uh, during a cycle, no ramp releases more vehicle than its queue size. Okay, so the queue is waiting. So let's say there are five vehicles at this ramp at the beginning of the cycle. It will release the five vehicles whenever it gets, whenever it finds the right slot. Okay, but once it releases those five vehicles, even if the queue is forming here, it's not going to release until the cycle resets. And the cycle will reset essentially when all the ramps have released their released their vehicles. Right. So that's how this policy works. Now, of course, uh, clearly this is inefficient from many, many perspectives, right? Because cycle will end only when the network becomes empty. So you are basically creating a scenario where uh, there's congestion uh, at, the, at the ramps, but then you're waiting for the entire network to become, to become clear. Uh, but you will see that this, uh, so just, just wait for the analysis and you'll see some interesting, interesting uh, phenomenon there. So definitely this policy at, at low and medium traffic is not going to do very well in terms of travel time. But at high traffic, it's going to do better than some of the existing algorithms also. But we are going to further improvise upon this policy. But one of the reasons why, why this policy is a good starting point is because it is inspired by a similar policy from communication and manufacturing systems known as a quota policy. And I'm, I'm providing a reference here at the bottom, right? So those policies have similar nature, uh, but they're designed, uh, they did not, they, there was no consideration for the dynamics of vehicles, et cetera, that we, that we have here. Um, so the, the performance of this policy is as follows, right? So, um, and in all of, the, all of the results that I'm going to mention in terms of performance, uh, I'm not explicitly mentioning the initial condition, right? So the initial condition is uh, the idea, the, the, it's implicit that the result is true for every initial condition, which is safe. So the renewal policy, uh, uh, the performance is that the network remains undersaturated for all demands that satisfy this particular criteria. Okay, so 
Uh, let me let me talk about the first term and uh, the, the importance of the second term will become clear later on. So the right hand side is exactly one over tau the fundamental limit. But the left hand side, uh, if you recall the connection with the, the necessary condition, there's this extra term here. This tau j, if you recall, is the, is the gap that a ramp j has to wait for before it releases a vehicle. And that minimum is two tau. So if all the ramps at high merge speed, then tau j will become equal to two tau, and this will become two minus one, and this term will disappear. So this will, for the high merge speed case, this policy will give the same saturation limit as the, as the fundamental limit. So it is going to be optimal. But when some of the ramps are short, for example, I mean, which because of which there are low merging speeds, then uh, there is a gap. Now, whether the gap is, is because of inefficient, our inefficient algorithm, our lack of analysis, rigorous analysis remains to be seen. Uh, but this factor, the way you want to think is the, it's, it's a factor by which the flow, the outflow from a, from a ramp gets reduced because of its low merge speed. Okay, so remember you have to look for bigger and bigger gaps uh, if you have low merge speed. And that factor is determined by tau j. Okay. So that was a, a policy where the cycle length was state dependent. Let's look at fixed cycle lengths. Okay, so fixed cycle lengths, uh, the, the system is going to reset, the cycle is going to reset after a predetermined cycle. Uh, and that cycle length could be one. Um, so in addition to the criteria that I had for releasing, meaning watching for the appropriate time of gap, let's say the, the ramps add an additional constraint on waiting for a minimum time G between successive release. So this is going to allow coordination, right? So if G was zero, then every ramp will act greedily whenever they see a gap. But higher values of G, uh, if the G value is high, then uh, it allows pause between release of successive vehicles. So that allows coordination. And if you choose G properly, then it's not going to hurt the saturation limit by a lot. And uh, the idea is G is going to be dynamic. It's going to depend upon the state of the system, right? So in fact, uh, G is going to uh, depend on what the, the vehicle state error. So how far is the traffic from being free flow, right? So if the vehicle speeds are not speed limit, if the gaps are not it, what the ideal gap we want them, et cetera, then that will quantify as an error. And if the error is positive, if you're, too, if you're far away from the free flow state, then you will increase your gap, this gap G uh, exponentially. And if the if the if you're starting to approach the free flow limit, free flow configuration in the main line, then you will start decreasing the gap, right? So this gap is shared, at least for this policy, by all the all the ramps. And uh, for high values of G, then it, it it pauses, it slows down the release of, of vehicles from all the ramps. Okay. So the performance of this policy is is as follows. Uh, so for every cycle length, independent of what cycle length you choose, therefore you could choose cycle length equal to one. The network is un, un, unsaturated, undersaturated if this condition is satisfied. So this condition looks very similar to the condition that we had for the renewal policy, uh, except for lack of an additional minus term here on the left-hand side. Uh, and in fact, because of that, at least as far as the sufficient condition is concerned, this is this is better than this is this is actually worse than uh, worse than the one under renewal policy. Okay. So again, this policy. The dynamic release rate policy allows for cycle length one, right? So it does not, and potentially it will not unnecessarily stop the vehicles until the network becomes empty. But in spite of that, as you approach the heavy traffic limit, uh, its saturation limit, at least as far as sufficient condition is concerned, is lower than, than the one under renewal policy. And one quick explanation is the following. And this is something may not be obvious at the first glance. So, that the renewal policy, as inefficient it may look on the first glance, is more efficient in space utilization in the following way. So uh, in order to utilize space, the mainline space more efficiently, it's uh, when you have a low merge speed case, it's better to release vehicles in batches. Why? Because if you want to release only one vehicle, you need a gap of tau j, which could be more than two tau. But if you want to release two vehicles, you just need an extra tau gap, okay? So the marginal increase in the gap that you need for every extra vehicle that you add into the batch is, is, is better. And it turns out that because of the construction of the renewal policy, the chances of seeing these big gaps are higher under renewal policy than under, under, under dynamic release rate policy. And this is the reason why potentially, uh, again, this is this a sufficient condition, but you, you potentially have a higher saturation limit under dynamic release rate policy. So, 
In the interest of time, I'm going to just sc uh, scroll through. I'm just going to quickly glance through the proof technique because this is something that we had to develop new. Uh, so the, the proof is consists of two parts. Uh, one is uh, our choice of this gap G as a function of the state of the system allows it to, uh, to, to make the system go to free flow, so-called free flow in finite time when all the vehicles are moving at free flow speed and all of that. Therefore, uh, without loss of generality, we can assume the initial condition is free flow. So the idea is to construct a Markov chain and do a stochastic stability as is standard in many queuing systems, right? So the mark state of the Markov chain is the destinations of the vehicle. So this is something that we have to construct. And the Lyapunov function is the sum of the square of what we call is the maximum on-ramp degree. So then on-ramp degree is uh, at any time is the number of vehicles that want to cross that ramp before they reach the destination. Okay, so not the queue length. So not the on-ramp queue length, that's not our Lyapunov function, but it is this, this particular quantity. And also we add this and uh, square of that quantity over a time horizon. We look, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, over a certain delta time in the past. And the reason again is because in order to show the negative drift of this, we need to, we need to look at uh, sufficiently in the past because it, again, because it takes time for, for vehicles to enter and reach the destination, all of that, right? So uh, the proof is quite involved and uh, it's all the details are in, are in the paper, uh, but uh, uh, again, Q length uh, does not work in this case. Uh, as, as, as a valid Lyapunov function. Okay, uh, so if you recall in this dynamic release rate policy, it, uh, it, uh, the, it gives the same saturation limit for all cycle lengths, right? So the question is then, uh, what's the effect of cycle length on other performance metrics? So here, is, here are some discussions there. Again, uh, if you divide the analysis into high merge speed and low merge speed case, uh, when you have a high merge speed, the average queue size at the ramps uh, 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 decreases with uh, decreasing uh, cycle length. So shorter cycle length do give you better travel time. On the other hand, when the merge ramps are small, which is again, a more practical case, uh, it's not clear. In fact, what is clear from our extensive simulations is that one cycle length uh, is not optimal from a, from, a, from a travel time point of view. But on the other hand, there is, there is no monotonicity either. So it's, it's quite complicated. Uh, but but the optimum seems to be somewhere somewhere uh, beyond one. So that's that's a message uh, that you that you want to get uh, out of this. Okay, now there are variations of, of this policy that I just described. Uh, if you recall, uh, knowing the state of all the vehicles is quite cumbersome when you have so many vehicles. There are distributed implementations of this dynamic release rate policy, where each ramp decides its own uh, release rate g based on its local traffic condition, based on the vehicles without its vicinity. And uh, by choosing this, this mechanism appropriately, we can show that you can achieve the same saturation limit as the centralized version. Uh, the other variation of this, of this, uh, of this policy uh, is instead of, uh, instead of modulating the release rate, you could look for bigger gaps and that way you can enforce coordination. So this is something what we call as the dynamic space gap policy, right? So instead of uh, requiring, uh, so waiting, for the, for the exactly the right gap, you wait for a bigger gap. And how much bigger gap, again, depends on how far is the network uh, from the free flow contiguation. So again, by choosing this dependence properly, uh, we, we, we can again come up, uh, we can again show that you get the same, same saturation limit as, as the dynamic release rate policy. So uh, there, are, there are many features, several features that I, that I kind of push under the rug. Uh, if, you, if you had noticed, I was using the circular geometry uh, out of convenience to, to show a lot of results, uh, but we have ongoing work and some finished work where extensions to more more general network configuration. Now, of course, the, the policies themselves work no matter what the network configuration is. It is the, it is the analysis, it's the performance that, uh, that, that depends on the network configuration, right? So uh, when, you, when you want to extend to a general network, uh, then uh, for those of you who know about uh, dynamical analysis of traffic flow models, even macroscopic traffic models, you know the most troublesome features are the merge intersections, uh, which is which also turns out to be the case at the microscopic level. Uh, so the idea is uh, this this uh, common link uh, downstream link three uh, enforces uh, the upstream links to to share the slots that are in front of them, right? Even if even if there is nothing uh, upstream that they need to worry about. So the idea is that if if two links are are going to share uh, a, a link downstream. So for example, they have to allocate, uh, they have to do some kind of rate allocation between that. So for example, 
both the uh, orange cars and the, and the green cars will only fill up uh, every other slot if the rate allocation is half and half, for instance. So it could be, it could be other. Mm -hmm. So this such a rate allocation then affects the kind of saturation limit, right? So in the, in the following way that I'm mentioning. So the second term inside the max uh, is, is because of the length of the ramp, this tau j over tau. So low ramp speeds, low merging speeds uh, affects your, uh, induces a gap between the, fund, between the max limit and what you can achieve. But also the rate, rate allocation also 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 does that. So this first term is because of the merge, and the second term is because of the local geometry, whether the ramp is big or small. Uh, lane changing is a very very uh, challenging feature. Um, so when you have multiple lanes, let's say three lanes, naturally the maximum limit, uh, the necessary condition will increase by three four. But in order to uh, for your policy to uh, have a scalable uh, improvement in performance you have to coordinate lane changing and ramp range. So one of the trade off, the key trade off here is uh, when, a, when a vehicle joins uh, the, from the ramp into the first slowest lane, there's a trade off. On one hand, it wants to switch to one of the neighboring lanes to make more efficient use of space, but then it has to come back to this lane to take the exit, right? So we have some initial work, uh, which I'm happy to discuss on coordinating lane, uh, lane changing and ramp metering to again achieve that saturation limit as, as closely as, as possible. So finally, here is a comparison of travel time between, so the performance metric that we have chosen so far was the saturation limit, uh, but uh, travel time is a commonly used metric. And here is a comparison between uh, the travel times under our policies and then a linear controller, which is one of the well-known RAM metering algorithms that has also been deployed in practice, right? So uh, the, linear, the way a linear controller works, it, it tries to maintain a certain optimal occupancy on, on the freeway, on the neighboring freeway segment. That's the operation principle of a linear. So what we did was we took the linear controller and on top of that enforced a safety constraint because the linear control by itself, because it's based on macroscopic models, it doesn't, doesn't allow safety considerations. So we, we impose the safety considerations like a vehicle can merge only when there's a gap and all of that. And we compare the travel time performance with uh, the policies that I just mentioned, right? So the renewal policy, the dynamic restated distributed version, the dynamic space gap policy. So that are the bottom four are our policy and the linear is, is the is, is the is the competing policy from literature. Uh, and we chose intentionally, we chose a, a, a demand so that it was very high. And our objective here was to show that if you choose a demand high enough, then that some existing policies will not be stabilizing. As you can see by the blue curve, it's becoming unstable. The queue size is growing, the delay is growing unbounded, whereas all our policies are, are remaining are bounded, right? So this row, the, 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 the load factor or the travel demand at this, in this simulation was high, about 0.9, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, and this is beyond what Alinea can handle. This again goes to illustrate that saturation limit has been largely ignored by the community in the, in the, in the process of optimizing for travel time. They implicitly assume that the demand is sufficiently low. But what's the point of minimizing travel time if it's going to be unbounded, right? Whereas it could be bounded if you could design your, your policy, policy uh, pair, I guess, or if you could be cognizant of, of the saturation limit as a performance metric. Uh, this doesn't mean to say that we, when we go to low and medium traffic, our policy will necessarily perform uh, better in terms of travel time. In fact, if you look at the renewal policy here, which was again a policy which requires a network to empty before it releases the next batch, etc. As you as you can expect, its travel time is, is high. Uh, but uh, but again, in terms of the statute, as you get closer to the to the uh, congestion, it it does better in terms of travel time as would expect uh, than than the competing ones. So again, the message here is saturation limit is, is an important metric that has been largely ignored in the, in the community. I think the closest we have, uh, we have are those maximum flow coming from the fundamental diagram. I think they have limitations. They, uh, they do not have the resolution to study the impact of, uh, of control and connectivity. And we also uh, came up with the metering algorithms which do maximize saturation limit. And hopefully we convince to you that if you pay attention to the saturation limit, then you will have seen uh, improvements in travel time at least at high congestion. Uh, ongoing work and open problems, uh, saturation limit. So again, to repeat, there is no gap between our uh, between the performance of the algorithms and the fundamental limit when the, when the merge speed is high. But the interesting things start happening when the merge speeds are low. That's when we start to see the gap. And as I said, that gap could be 
because the, the, the necessary condition is too loose or, or, or the analysis is too loose. But also, higher moments play a role when you have low merge speed. So saturation limit starts depending on, on the higher moments of the arrival process once you have low merge speed. So again, that's something that we have not completely fleshed out. Right? In fact, it's a, it's a challenging problem from a purely queuing system perspective also. Um, in, our, in our work, we implicitly assume there's a finite queue storage capacity at the on-ramps, that is before the ramp meters. Uh, relaxing that is, is also is challenge also at the macro level. So it's going to be really challenging for us also, but definitely something that we can, we can investigate through extensive simulations, micro simulations, for example, in the sim, something that we plan to do. And finally, uh, yes, travel time, we, we showed uh, improvements in travel time, but using some uh, uh, tools on wait time analysis from queuing theory, we could, we could provide more analytical insights into, into travel time. One final point that I would like to make is that all of our policies were traffic responsive, meaning they, they require uh, real-time knowledge of congestion, but they did not require information about the travel demand. So they did not require information about Lambda and R. So they were agnostic to the actual travel demand. They also did, did not need to know the destination of the vehicles, or they did not need to predict the demand either, right? So they are pretty lightweight in terms of what information they need. So uh, with that, I'll stop here. These are a couple of papers uh, uh, for those of you who are in finding out more details. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask me now or email me, email me later. Um, and as I said, my student Milad is here. He can, he can answer all the tough questions, but uh, thank you everybody. Thank you, Ketan. Very, very interesting talk. Um, let's open the stage for questions. So you can either unmute yourself and uh, raise the hand and I will call you or type the question in the chat and I will read it for you. So let's see who wants to start. Uh, I, I start as usual. Uh, okay, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thanks, Ketan. Uh, this is, uh, does this remind, uh, what, are the, what is the relation between this work that you presented and the pressure, kind of like control for traffic lights or, you know, more in general, what is the relation that you see between metering versus traffic lights or more in general intersections versus roundabout, for example? Right, so this, this notion of gap, uh, which, which actually plays a role, uh, at least the, the, the work that I've seen on back pressure and traffic light does not exist. You don't need to wait for it, it's, it's a point queue. It's a vertical queue. All the queues are point queues. Right. Here, here you want to think you have horizontal queues. So those gaps do matter. Right. But you can you could imagine, right, that you create gaps by so um, um <laughs> so in a sense, if if you have a like like a like a traffic light, right? So something that is artificially creating gaps, right? So instead of having the, the metering on the ramp, right? So in a sense, you also put the metering on the, uh, on the main road, right? Yeah. Um, and, and then you artificially create gaps um, yeah. versus, you know, but also what you see some people talking about, you have all these videos about autonomous yes. intersections, right? That I don't believe, right? So in a sense, they're also doing with intersections what you do with gaps on, on merging. Yeah. Right. So that just fit cars across in the, the, the flow at gaps. Um, yeah. I, I'm wondering if there is a, uh, like a message about, for example, uh, you know, really like emerging versus intersection, right? So for example, should we use more like uh, roundabouts? Uh, versus intersections, or you know, the, I don't know if you ever thought about this this way. Yeah. So, well, my okay, my understanding of the trade-off between roundabout intersections is the switch time. Uh, so, I mean, at, at low traffic, uh, vehicles have to wait for long before they get. Uh, I mean, if you use a if you use a traffic light, whereas in a roundabout, they could just go whenever they have a gap. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, my understanding is that's the, that's the extent of uh, of discussion that's there. Uh, here, um, the I guess I guess maybe one way to phrase your question is: Are there implications of what we are doing here for traffic intersections? Perhaps. Uh, mm -hmm. the, what if I guess maybe one way to think is: What if the main line uh, shrinks to zero? <laughs> maybe 
uh, right? So the we, right now we have this network and there's ramps, off ramps and on ramps. I mean, we could we could shrink the main line to zero and and see if uh, it's uh, will, will this give some kind of a back pressure? I don't know if that's that's the question that's the question you are you are asking. Uh, We, I don't know, honestly, it's, uh, well, first, first of all, there is no pressure because we are not, our policy do not take into account what's happening at the off ramp. So if, if anything, uh, this might right. be to, to proportional, I mean, the more the other classes of algorithms like proportionally fair, for example, which only look at the upstream queue, they don't look at the downstream queue. Right. Um, but, but again, I, Again, I don't know if this is what you are suggesting is what I have in mind. So what I have in mind is to draw a connection between this and the traffic lights to think of mainline going to zero. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I see, I see what, what you're saying. see how this policy behaves. Uh, but then that would get rid of the gaps and everything that, that you were saying. Right, right. Now, another thing that I, you know, you have this notion of um, uh, what we call it saturation. Yes. Which is point wise, right? Uh, when you say point-wise, it's the flow that, at a certain it is flow at a certain point. So the saturation limit, no, it's a it's a it's a network definition. It is so, a network. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it is. So that's the one of the uh, I guess message we are giving is that the maximum flow that people usually use as a notion of saturation limit is point-wise. There have been extensions to that network just by taking average of the maximum flow of, of different links, etc. But that's not what we're doing here. We're trying to mm -hmm. characterize a set of of the flows which are feasible at the ramps. Mm -hmm. I always wonder, you know, how much all of this is affected really by, for example, the um, think of it as the geometry, right, of the of the downstream. Uh huh. So. So downstream, by you mean off ramps? Off ramps and other on ramps. <laughs> so that is taken into account. So by mm -hmm. by geometry, if you mean, for example, uh, if the if the of the off or oh, but by the other on ramps, if they are small, for example, and by small, like I don't know if you remember in Pasadena here, right? So where mm -hmm. the vehicles can only merge at a very small speed, uh, right. which can which can really obstruct traffic. That is taken into account in everything. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the factors tau j that I was showing here, they capture. Uh, how much disturbance they are going to, uh, how much they are going to disturb the free flow on the main line, mm -hmm. and that does affect the saturation limit. Okay. And the coordination is precisely to ensure that the disturbance doesn't propagate. I mean, it's implicit in the in the in the in the, in the analysis. Okay. Any any thoughts about like fairness in a sense? So that's uh, a, I mean that's, I mean yes uh, we so yeah I think that's a good point something that we have thought thought about so. I mean, we have, I mean, if you think of just two, two, two RAM case, I mean, we, we give uh, our saturation limit is in terms of all combinations of lambda and lambda two mm -hmm. that can be sustained by the network. So of course, within that, we can start thinking about fairness, right? So if we, we can say, okay, if we want lambda and lambda two to be equal, then what's the maximum that you can, you can have? Or if they want it to be in a certain proportion. That's as far mm -hmm. as saturation limit is concerned, but of course, when we have travel time, uh, also we can talk about fairness uh, there also. But we can already talk about such in terms of saturation limit. Yes, we should. We can talk about fairness. Yes, we haven't, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a notion? Okay, so and this is uh, I am actually trying to make a connection to some of the work that we are doing. Um, so if you had one of the people on the on-ramp, for example, mm -hmm. has a particular reason that you know, they are particularly in a rush, right? So is there a mechanism by favoring some interactions at certain times, right? So for example, uh, you know, somebody you know, is in a rush, maybe like an emergency vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a mechanism to let the emergency vehicle in an earlier slot than otherwise? Right. So. So again, if, if those incidents are infrequent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you could you could pause whatever you're doing here, let that go. And again, our algorithms uh, provide this uh, guarantee starting from any initial condition. Right? Mm -hmm. 
So if that emergency vehicle needs priority, give that priority, uh, but then whatever the, that would have changed uh, the free flow condition to something else. And then our algorithms can kick in and bring back uh, bring back the performance to its to its level. So mm -hmm. yes, as long as those those are infrequent, uh, it it will not affect the performance. Okay, because you're saying that okay, so there will be a small perturbation and then yeah. things will, will go back to normal quickly, yes. right? So yeah. then, if this is uh, if these events are infrequent in the sense that uh, you know compared to the time scale of the yes you know, yes or reverting back to the thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kat. And I, I don't, I don't want to take all of your time. So I don't know if other people have questions. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, maybe I start. Emilio gave me the assist for for one now. Um, I had, my question was: Have you performed studies to see if knowing how this these policies work could be leveraged by by some users of the of the network, like? If I, I know I'm thinking like in a game theoretic setting, for instance, in which you you know how the policies are designed, and so you you try to maximize your own return by not respecting certain rules. Yeah. And how would that affect the the, the others, for instance? Right. So I mean, there. I mean, it's, let me. I mean, it's a broad question. So let me let me say some of the things. I mean, let me first clarify some of the assumptions, um, which which naturally tell you the limitation of our work so far. Right. So. Uh, we assume more or less a controlled environment here. So I assume uh, earlier in the talk, I mentioned a certain vehicle following behavior and emerging behavior. Uh, so that uh, that excludes some of this thing that you were mentioning, right? So if somebody wants to not, I mean, as long as it's a few people, it's okay. I mean, as long as that's okay, as similar to the response that I was giving to Emilio. But if if uh, if they form a cartel if some, in some sense and they, uh, they try to maintain very small gaps and all of that. Yes, it's possible, right? The other thing is once they know the policy, uh, they could alter the, the arrival process, right? They could uh, they could all go to a different uh, different ramp, etc. So here, the demand process arrival process is assumed to be independent of the policy, exogenous, right? Okay, okay, of course, the natural thing is okay. What if uh, there is there is a game theoretic uh, process that generates this lambda one and r and all of that? I mean that that is an interesting question. Yes, uh, that could build upon upon this, but something we have not done so far. So to okay. answer your question, uh, inside the network, as long as the the adversarial agents, let me call them adversarial agents, if there are few, I don't think that's going to affect uh, much. Uh, few and far between. But if they are if they are non significant portion, then something then we have to, yeah. Then that leads to more abstractly an extension to heterogeneous vehicle following behaviors. Uh, some following a certain safe cap, others following a more risky safe cap. In that case, what will be the saturation limit? So that's a that's that's a more okay. More that's a separate area. question. Yeah. Okay. Like heterogeneous traffic. Yeah. So here we assume homogeneous to the extent that they follow the same safe cap. Yes. Okay. Very interesting. And my second question was: um, so in in a full network, obviously you have a composition of different scenarios, like the ones you were showing. Uh, yeah. Have you have you thought about or have you tried applying different policies to different regions, but then evaluating the full composition of those policies? Like what I'm saying is, uh, you were showing the differences between some policies yes. uh, in the end, but I, I think this was assumed to work on the on a particular scenario or on the full network was the same policy for 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 the evaluation, right? Right. Uh, so I, have uh, you no. talked about mixing policies for different? Um, but is there policies? is there a particular reason why you think uh, one should? No, no, I, I just uh, I yeah. no, but I, I just understand that maybe different scenarios require different. Yeah, but but again, scenario. No, so again, like yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. So, so number one, uh, our simulations were only for one scenario, uh, which was this circular geometry and and line geometry, which I did not show. Uh, they did not, the simulations were not for this merge and divide. So you're right that uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, the, some policies favor one geometry versus other. And so actually we are in the process of doing VSIM simulation. Uh, you probably know what that's like trying to model yes. some, actually model LA freeway network, et cetera. And actually that's a suggestion we can, we can keep in mind. But uh, our, our, yeah, our, our intention was to really be exhaustive when we go to VSIM simulation. Yeah. 
This okay. was like, the intention of this simulation is to show that if you do not take into account saturation limit in your in your design, and if you choose your demand to be high, then then uh, things can really go bad. Okay. Uh, that yeah. Thank you very much. Um, any other question from the audience? That's that. Ask questions. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you for uh, the nice talk. Uh, can we? Can you quickly go to slide ten? Ten. I think okay. that's where you first introduced the idea of coordination. Here. Um. So yes. So here, that was the example where uh, if the greedy policy would lead to uh, uh, basically starving uh, ramp two. Yes. Uh, so my question is about, so for coordination as a coordination device, uh, you use the gap G and, yeah. uh, is this, and I, can you motivate that a bit? Like why, why isn't there maybe some sort of communication happening between the ramps? So, or, yes, uh, you so yeah, looking I, at the Q length. Right, so it is. Uh, so I did not go into all the details, but when I when I say coordination, I mean how would the coordination happen? Right, it's going to be through communication. So either either is there's a central controller like a traffic management center, for example, which collects information from all the ramps um, and tells what each ramp needs to do in terms of G, or it could be through ramp to ramp communication. And in order to determine G, uh, if you recall, uh, it, it depends on this X, E, X, X is nothing but the state of the network. I mean, the state of the vehicles and how far are they and how far are they away from achieving their, their free flow? So yes, uh, that is, that is what we are doing now. As I said, there you can, you can realize this coordination through ramp to ramp communication or through one I mean, centralized uh, node. I don't know if I answer your question. Um, but can't you coordinate like, okay. Uh, three vehicles release from ramp one, uh, two vehicles from ramp two. Yes, so, so that is that is that is implicitly being done here. So, okay. so that is implicitly being done. So by by changing G, uh, yeah. what G does it it slows down the release, right? Uh, okay. So uh, so the renewal policy, as I was saying, which does not use G it has a feature that it tends to release vehicles in batches. It's a, it's a feature of this policy because again, uh, each, so for, in this case, for example, if this ramp was starved until now, because there was constant traffic coming in until now, but at some point the previous ramp is going to stop. And in that case, this ramp is going to release everything. So the renewal policy acts like a batch policy as opposed to this dynamic release rate policy, which, which uh, tends to form much smaller batches. So it, all of those features and um, are kind of hidden under are, are actually the effect of how these policies work. So we do not determine the batch size per se, but by changing the G and uh, other features of the algorithm, we are in, in essentially changing the batch size indirectly. That's what we are doing. Okay, and but here you were using one single G for the whole network. Yes. Is this okay? But then there is a variant that has. That has different Gs, yes. When we do the distributed version here. Okay. And they they are they produce the same results to me intuitively. Yes, they, they produce the same result. If you of course, if okay. you have to choose this properly, yeah. Okay, to me intuitively, you wouldn't necessarily want like I feel that you could have scenarios where you want to release three vehicles from ramp one, but only two from ramp two. So having the same G everywhere. Yes. So, so again, uh, same G does not necessarily mean you will release the same, right? Because how much you release depends upon how many are waiting and how much gap you see on the main line. So there, there are three factors that affect how many you release. One is how big of a gap you see, because you could have three waiting and you could have zero G, meaning, uh, but then there's no gap, then what are you going to do, right? So the batch, even if you decide what batch you want, I mean, let's say you decide a batch of three, 
but then you have a gap of two. Would, should you waste that gap of two or should you just let two go and then maybe send one later, right? So that's why we don't decide upon the bad sides. We say, if you see a gap, then either go for it or do not go for it based on the value of G. If the G is high, that means uh, you should wait long before successive release. And as a successive release, meaning as soon as you see a gap release. Uh, so again, the bad size, yeah, you are right that some scenarios, certain bad size makes sense, et cetera. But one has to keep in mind that by just by deciding a bad size, you cannot decide bad size just based on G. I guess you, you also need a space and you need a vehicles waiting upstream I mean, at the ramp to go in. Uh, so we found that rather than playing directly with the bad size, it's helpful from the analysis point of view. So I'm not saying there could be an algorithm which directly modulates the bad size, but for us from an analysis point of view, uh, playing with the G was, was much more convenient and it seems to do well in terms of saturation limit, but doesn't mean that there could be other policies which do similar. Thanks. Okay. Great, and thank you, Ketan, for taking more time for questions. Uh, with this, I think we can we can close the seminar. And uh, again, thank you, thank you very much for your time, and good luck for the next steps. I, I'm sure you will find out even more interesting things. Okay. Very very fascinating topic. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. See you all next week for the next talk. <laughs>